Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Rol Tietema. I am uh, moderating only the, the keynote session now, this morning. I would like to uh, introduce as keynote speaker, Dr. Steve Johnson. He's director of R&D at the Timken Company. He manages a team of uh, about 165 persons covering R&D in all fields like materials, materials science, engineering, tribology, IP management, and so on, and so on. So I'm uh, very pleased that uh, Dr. Johnson can give this talk. Please step forward. <laughs> Good morning. <clears throat> All right. So, um, thank you to uh, uh, kind introduction, and thank you to the organizing committee for uh, giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you this morning. Uh, so as you can see from the title, my talk is it's all about the surface, and that's in the context of the tribological contact that goes on inside things like rolling element bearings, and particularly the role that thin film coatings plays in the performance of the product. Nobel Prize winning physicist Wolfgang Pauli is quoted as saying, God made the bulk, the surface was invented by the devil. So with that sort of setting the tone for this morning, here's what we're going to talk about. I'll give you a bit of a brief introduction, a bit of a history to bearings, just to make sure we're all on the same page as to what we're talking about, and particularly around damage trends that we see in bearings. Um, and that would lead us into how important the surface is and the design of the surface, and then how we use coatings as part of that surface design. And then we'll move into the performance of the coatings in a variety of different applications, and we'll finish up with where we think things are headed and what comes next. So tribology in the title, what is that? So tribology, quite simply, goes back to the 50s. It was coined by a British gentleman from the Greek word tribos, which means to rub. And it's defined as the science of interacting surfaces in relative motion. So if you're into bearings and gears, pretty important stuff and gets into wear, lubrication, et cetera. So a little bit of history uh, from a hieroglyph, uh, circa 2400 BC, probably the world's first recorded tribologist. Uh, you can see the guy uh, bending over in the middle here, blown up down here. Uh, so they're moving a large statue on a sled, and he's the guy charged with pouring the lubricant, probably water, to reduce the friction. Moving forwards a little bit in history, the Assyrians are credited with inventing the rolling element bearing because they figured out if they put logs under their sled, things got easier, and they only needed a couple of thousand people instead of 10,000 people to drag the statue. So now we have rolling element bearings. And then even around the time of Christ, there's been evidence, uh, you can see there the fragment of what was a large rotary wooden platform supported on uh, bronze balls, on cast iron, on steel spindles. Um, and then into the Renaissance, da Vinci, one of his sketches of his design of a thrust ball bearing. And then just to make sure we're all clear on what rolling element bearings are, the animation that you can see running in the lower left-hand corner shows you the typical configuration of a rolling element bearing. Quite simply, two rings and a plethora of rolling elements. And obviously, this would be for rotary motion. Uh, you can have a similar arrangement for, for linear motion. There's a variety of classifications of bearings. When I talk to most people who aren't in the industry and you say, you know, a bearing, they mean, oh, you mean ball bearings. Um, because that's what everybody immediately thinks of when you talk about bearings. And it's quite simply, uh, it's no surprise because 60% of all the bearings made and sold on the planet are, in fact, ball bearings. And the reason for that is it's much easier to make balls than it is to make rollers. So that makes them lower cost. And they're also very efficient. Um, but all of these different classifications of bearings that you see on the screen all have strengths and weaknesses. And the weakness of the ball bearing is it is a ball point contact. It can only carry relatively limited loads. If your application requires you to carry more load than you can get from the ball bearing, now you need a roller with a line contact. And there's three main configurations of rollers simply described by the shape of the roller. Cylindrical, spherical, which are like little beer kegs, and conicals. Each of these classifications has strengths and weaknesses in application. So for example, if you look at the tapered bearing, its Achilles heel is the contact between the end of the roller and the thrust rib that, is pushing, that the roller is pushing up against. It's a mixed mode slide roll contact. 
It works fine when there's a lubricant around. If the lubricant should go away for any reason, then things deteriorate rapidly. So what's life like inside a rolling element bearing? A pretty extreme. Um, I thought I'd try and give you some context around the type of applications. And here's one hopefully we can all relate to. So your average pickup truck, uh, you can see one pictured there. Driving straight down the road, so simply supporting the load of the, of the, of the vehicle. Uh, you can see the design of the bearing in the bottom right-hand side, two rows of bearings. The contact pressure between the rolling element and the raceway is almost 200,000 pounds per square inch, or roughly 1.5 gigapascals. Um, very, very, very high contact pressures. And in fact, that may sound extreme, uh, but routinely we design bearings that work two, two and a half times that sort of load day in and day out. So very, very high contact pressures. And under that pressure, the film thickness that exists between the interfaces is measured in micro inches. So you can see five micro inches or 130 nanometers. To give you a sense of just how much pressure that is, if you take a fully loaded 747-400, full passengers, cargo, fuel, weighs in at about 400,000 kilos, 880,000 pounds. If you were to balance that on your average 14 and a half ounce tin can, that tin can would see the same pressure that the rolling elements see inside the bearing. And relative to that contact thickness, uh, the Chinese are just finishing what will be the largest aperture spherical telescope in the world when completed. It's half a kilometer across, 500 meters. If I make my roller that big, my film thickness is now four millimeters. So we're talking about very, very thin films. So moving into damage trends. So what happens when things go wrong inside rolling element bearings? Well, I've had the fortune of working for the Timken Company for 41 years. Over the course of my career, I've seen a major shift in failure modes. So when I started my career, the typical failure modes of bearings and gears to a large extent as well was inclusion-related failure, basically a failure of the material system. So you have non-metallic inclusions uh, that come as a part of the steel making process. And up to about the mid 80s, uh, they were of sufficient size and quantity that they would cause classical fatigue issues in the material and they would lead to the vast majority of bearing failures, 90 plus percent. Since the mid 80s, and we figured out how to dramatically improve the cleanness of steel using air melt processing, not just vacuum melt, um, that failure mode has really, has really dropped off. I mean, single digit percentages now. So where we see failure today, it all comes from surface initiated. And you can see some examples in the photographs here. So the lower left-hand corner is an example of what we call micro pitting. And this is very near surface fatigue. It's a traction-driven event, so it, it comes about through slip and sliding that's going on between the rolling elements and the surface, and, it, and it, it yields to this particular failure mode. You remember that tapered roller bearing we talked about a few minutes ago and what happens if the oil goes away? Well, the middle picture is what happens if the oil goes away. Um, thermal degradation, a lot of sliding, scoring, smearing of material. Um, and a lot of what is at the root cause of these types of failure modes is the concept of adhesive wear. So steel has a great affinity for steel chemically. So under the sorts of contact pressures that you see in these applications, steel will bond to itself atomically. Now remember, tribology requires motion as well. So I make a bond and then I break those bonds. And we call this adhesive wear. And so this mechanism of adhesive wear is really what is at the root of a lot of these surface initiated failure modes. And if you wonder what early stage adhesive wear looks like, you can see that on the right hand side, uh, the lower right hand picture. We did a study a couple of years ago and looked at fail bearings that had come back in from the field and did forensic analysis on them to determine you know, why these bearings failed. And you can see from the pie chart, 75% of the failures were due to issues at the surface. Most of them coming from either contaminant had got into the bearing, debris of some form, um, or it was the wrong oil or insufficient oil or old lubricant. Um, so it was all lubricant and surface related issues over 75%. So clearly then the surface is now extremely important in the performance of these products. So what is it we think about as we design these surfaces? So the contact between the rolling element and the raceway is, is called a Hertzian contact. And here you can see a schematic that I uh, stole shamelessly from a good friend of mine, Vern Wedevan, 
um, that shows you what's going on between the rolling element and the raceway. So we have the lubricant film, um, and this is an elastohydrodynamic film, EHL or EHD is the acronym for that. Um, and this is separating the surfaces, ideally. Uh, the red film could be a tribofilm that's formed on the surface due to some sort of chemical interaction between the lubricant and the base material that can help uh, prevent adhesive wear. And then as you move into the near surface material, uh, you have the texture and the asperities of the surface that are really supporting that stress. And then as you move into the subsurface and the bulk of the material, you're now supporting that, that uh, Hertzian contact, the Hertzian stress that exists. So the methods that we use to produce these surfaces are varied, and they all have different characteristics. And there's some examples of typical finishing processes shown here. So hard machining, you're using a defined cutting edge, uh, very uniform cutting conditions, and, and translating that across the surface of the component. Grinding, then, is you're taking a set of randomly oriented small abrasive particles bonded in some sort of media and translating those past the surface of the product, usually at relatively high speed. And as those abrasives interact with the surface, you're removing material and modifying the surface. Honing, is a, honing is, or super finishing, as it's also known, is a process very similar to grinding. We're just using finer abrasives, and we can get finer surface textures as a result. And then in the lower right-hand corner is an example of what's called a mass finishing process. And you can quite simply think of this as take a bucket of rocks, maybe with some abrasive slurry, throw your component in, and then shake the whole thing for a while. And what that vibration energy does is it causes the media to impact the surface of the product. And either with or without an abrasive uh, slurry involved, you will start to modify the surface texture. If we look at these surfaces in three dimensions using interferometric microscopy, this is what they look like. So you can clearly see, starting in the top left, the hard turning surface, tremendous directionality, very uniform surface comes from that defined cutting edge. Moving down to grinding, a little bit more randomized, but you can still see directionality in the surface, or what we call lay in the surface. Same thing with honing, but you can now see the improvement in surface texture. Interesting thing about the vibratory finishing process is you should not be able to discern any directionality. It's what we call an isotropic surface. And it's extremely good in, for products that are subjected to uh, rolling contact fatigue. So back a little bit more onto the mechanics of this EHL film. And again, I borrowed this from Vern. Um, what are the requirements? Well, I have to generate a hydrodynamic film. So there's motion involved. I need a lubricant. Uh, the media, the lubricant, needs to have a certain pressure viscosity behavior in order for this to work. And I have to have an elastic contact. Vern has this, uh, this acronym called MIRACLE that he uses to describe what goes on. But quite simply, this fundamentally is why rolling element bearings work. Without this mechanism, uh, we wouldn't have rolling element bearings today. And we can visualize this. So again, this is using interferometry, uh, a ball rolling on a glass disc with a lubricant layer involved, and the colors show you the different thicknesses of the lubricant as it passes through the interface. Uh, the ball is actually rolling, is traveling from right to left. The rolling motion relative to the surface is left to right. So you can see the inlet region on the left-hand side and this classical, what we call the horseshoe effect in terms of lubricant thickness. And then you can see wake turbulence uh, on the right-hand side. So we know a lot about what happens uh, relative to the interface and the role of lubricants. So in the good old days, Again, back in my, the early days of my career, most mechanical systems were designed for full separation. So the idea was the surfaces never came into contact, that you had a lubricant with sufficient viscosity and, and the application was designed in such a way that you tried to keep the surfaces separated. That would be on the right-hand side of this curve, which we call a Strybeck curve. And what's being plotted here on is the friction coefficient against a dimensionless parameter that we call lambda, the lambda ratio. And this lambda ratio is described uh, quite simply as the film thickness, so the lubricant film thickness, divided by the composite surface roughness. So it's a measure of separation. Do you have actual separation between the surfaces or not? So analytically, if, if lambda is one, then I have you know, I'm borderline contact. You would be in the middle, what we call mixed mode lubrication. 
If my lambda is greater than one, I'm on the right-hand side of the curve, full separation. If I'm less than one, now I've got fairly heavy contact between the surfaces. And you can see the red line, which shows you the different frictional characteristics as you move through these different contact regimes. Now, if I'm in mode one, boundary lube, I want to really try and reduce my friction, reduce the parasitic loss in the system. So, so what are my potential strategies? Well, I could look at different materials that fundamentally have different friction uh, attributes. I could play around with different lubricants, viscosity modifiers, um, or I could look at coatings. So coating is a surface layer. Surface layers have been around for a long time. Back in the 1900s, we figured out that oxides formed fairly readily on a lot of materials. Um, we started studying those. In the 1930s, we figured out we can actually control these, particularly where we have lubricants involved. And we started putting chemistry into the lubricant systems purposefully to react with the base materials. So extreme wear additives, extreme pressure additives, um, sulfurs, phosphors uh, that would form phosphates on the surface and form what was designed to be beneficial tribological films. And then as we move into more recent times, really starting in about the mid-1990s, we get into these thin film, uh, diamond-like carbon coatings. And one of the scientists that works for me, Ryan Evans, uh, this is work that he was doing in his PhD in the mid-90s, and he was working with tantalum carbide, not a coating that we've commercialized, but this was the beginning of things uh, for us at Timken. So let's move into coatings then. So thin films, what is a thin film? In the context of the applications we're talking about here, these are typically about a micron thick, one to two microns max. They're a solid layer attached to a solid sub substrate. You know, and the tribofilms fall into that category as well, and we were just talking about those. The trouble is with those is, you know, they're reactive in nature. Um, they can be difficult to predict. They're not easy to control. And in fact, as we often see, the additive package that gets put into lubricants to say go in the transmission is designed primarily to work with the gear system, believing that, well, if it's good for the gear, it'll be good for the bearings. Well, sometimes it isn't, sometimes it isn't, it, it depends. So these tribofilms can be beneficial, but they, we've also seen examples of where they can be detrimental. So these tribological coatings then now are proactively deposited onto finished components. So this is the final stage in manufacturing. And they've been specially engineered to have very specific performance uh, characteristics. And we're really talking about what happens in poorly lubricated conditions. So remember that Stryback curve? We're on the left-hand side of that chart. We're in boundary lube. We've got heavy surface interaction in our application. Um, and adhesive wear is going to be present unless we can do something to prevent it. So at Timkin, we have this whole field of what we call engineered surfaces, and they come in many different flavors. We have you know, traditional conversion coatings, things like black oxide, um, nitriding, phosphate, ex phosphating, et cetera. We have electrochemistry, so things like zinc nickel, uh, thin dense chrome have been used for a long time. But in the middle is really what we're going to talk about this morning for the rest of my talk, which is these hard coatings, DLC. Uh, we've got a range of titanium carbide as well as tungsten carbide-based coatings, all designed to increase wear resistance and reduce friction in application. So this ES300, which is our tungsten carbide series, um, there's several different forms of this. These can be applied to bearing components, gears, pins, shafts, all sorts of different products. Um, our development of this really goes back to about the mid-2000s. We actually started in the mid-90s, and we, we first figured out how to deposit these coatings at low temperatures because that was a challenge back then. Uh, most of our bearing steels, the tempering temperature is you know, 250, 280 Fahrenheit. So if you'll remember, these go on as a finished process. So if your coating processing temperature goes above that, you're going to have an issue in terms of the performance of the final product. So once we figured out how to deposit these at low temperatures, uh, in the chamber you see on the upper right, and that's now a part of our, uh, the Timken Engineered Surface Laboratory at the University of Akron. Uh, then we invested in production capability, and you can see one example of that in the lower right-hand corner. The benefits of these coatings is they're low friction, so they reduce friction, particularly in boundary or mixed-mode lubrication. Um, they reduce wear. They, they have improved micro-pitting resistance. Uh, they dramatically improve smearing and sliding uh, resistance. 
Um, and in terms of rolling contact fatigue life, so the fundamental life of the bearing in these low lambda conditions, uh, we see tremendous improvement. And they also work extremely well when you have contamination present, so a debris-laden environment. So ES302 is one version of this tungsten carbide coating that we offer commercially. You can see on the right-hand side a high-resolution transmission electron microscope image showing a very high magnification what these coatings look like. And you can see the small dot clusters, which are the tungsten carbide particles. They're about two nanometers in size embedded in an amorphous hydrocarbon matrix. It says they're moderately harder than steel. I would say they're significantly harder than steel. On the Rockwell C scale, we'd be up around 60, 68 to 70. So substantially harder than the steel substrate it's going on. But very importantly, the elastic modulus is much lower. And that's a very specific requirement because without that, under application conditions of those high, very high contact pressures, the steel is going to yield elastically. The coating has to be able to go with it, otherwise it's going to crack and delaminate. So on various length scales, you see layering in these coatings. And this is a great example of the lamellar nature of these types of coatings. So on the left-hand side, you can see bands. And through the atom probe tomography work, you can see these bands are about 25 nanometers. Uh, moving between tungsten carbide rich regions and carbon and hydrogen rich regions. And this is very important. This is part of how you engineer the modulus uh, of the material. So how do these coatings perform in application? Well, let's start with just simple bearing life. So clean oil environment, but challenging environment. You can see the test conditions in the lower left-hand corner. Lambda is 0.5. So we're very much a lot of surface interaction going on. And the baseline here is an all steel bearing. Um, the coated bearing, then, and notice we only coat the rollers. We have found that coatings on coatings is actually not as good as coating on steel. So we coat the rollers, and we get about a 10 times improvement in this application condition uh, versus the all steel bearing. So tremendous improvement in basic contact fatigue performance. And then also shown um, as another data point is what happens if you black oxide all the components. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's a couple of industries that have really latched onto black oxide here recently as the be all and end all uh, as performance enhancement. And yes, black oxide is better than all steel in these types of applications, but it's nowhere near as good as these tribological coatings. And one of the things I want to emphasize is the reason we have a number of different tungsten carbon, tungsten carbide based coatings is from a, from a fundamental chemistry standpoint. The, the chemical makeup of these coatings is almost identical. If you were to go in and count the atoms, there'd be very little difference between ES300 and ES302. But the microstructure of the coating has been engineered differently. And so the performance is very different. And we see this a lot in terms of the competitive coatings that we've analyzed as well. And you can see in the lower right-hand corner, under these application conditions, taking a commonly available tungsten DLC coating, and you can see what happened to the rollers. And this is not a delamination of the coating. This is actually a structural failure within the coating itself. And on the right-hand side, you can see an image of ES302 with no issues in terms of uh, intra-delamination between the, the coating uh, system. So that was clean oil, pure bearing life. So what happens if we throw some debris in for the mix? And you see a lot of debris in transmissions, for example. Gears are notorious for generating debris during early run-in stage in the machine. Um, and then that debris tends to float around um, along for the ride. Debris can be hard particle, maybe leftovers from you know, sandblasting on castings or something like that that was not effectively cleaned out. Or it can be soft ductile particles. Both of these can wreak havoc in terms of the performance of the bearing system. Hard particles tend to get embedded. They poke up through the lubricant layer. They damage the surfaces they're rolling against. And the ductile particles will get smushed as they go through the interface. Um, and form dents in the surface, and they will throw up shoulders of raised material. And you can see that depicted in the lower right hand, very lower right hand image. And so now those shoulders are, are sitting up and effectively giving you a localized reduction in the lambda ratio, and they can initiate adhesive wear from those shoulders. So what role does the coating play? Well, a couple of things. Remember, the coating is extremely hard, uh, much harder than even some of the hard particle debris that you would find in these applications. So it just tends to chew it up and spit it out. Now, the counterface will get damaged. 
However, because the coating is harder than the steel, it does a pretty effective job of actually polishing away the damage that can occur. And that's what you see in the two images on the lower left-hand side. You can see on the, on the left-hand image, um, around that dent, the red area showing you the raised material uh, that is going to be an initiation for adhesive wear. And then on the ES302, you can see how those shoulders have been polished away by the coating running against that and the hardness of the coating polishing away that material. And so what that gives you in the chart in the center is about a 3x improvement in performance between uh, the all steel baseline and then having coated rolling elements. So sliding. Cylindrical roller bearings are notorious for this because typically to, ascend them, you to assemble them, you have to have clearance in the bearing. So the nice thing about a tapered roller bearing is because everything's conical, if I apply an axial load, I'm actually loading the rollers against the raceway. Difficult to do that in a cylindrical roller bearing. And particularly if these are involved in high speed applications, this condition of slip can become a real challenge. And so here's a test we did where we took a cylindrical roller bearing and we loaded it, and typically we talk about the load zone, so 360 degrees of the bearing, and in this particular example, half the bearing was carrying the load. So we were applying a load in, in one direction, and then we reversed the load. And as you go back through that transition period, uh, you have a, a, a moment during the center of that where everything is unloaded and sliding. And then we oscillate this backwards and forwards twice a minute. And we do this for 100 minutes, and that's one cycle. And so what we were testing here is a number of different material systems and surface textures. So you can see the first three bars was just a plain ground surface. And then we super finished it with honing and applied the vibratory finish on top of that. So very fine surface texture. And then we took those and the third bar is we black oxided them. All three of those systems failed through the first cycle, that first 100 minutes. And you can see pictures on the upper right hand side of the types of failure. Apply the coating, and this is ES322. So ES20 is our internal jargon for, for the vibratory finish. Combine that with 302, you get 322. And that's the image on the lower right-hand side. Uh, after three cycles, we suspended the test because it was clear this was going to go on for a significant period of time. So the coating clearly has the ability to mitigate conditions of high slip in these applications. Another use for this. Uh, which is a little bit different, is to have the coating along in the event of an emergency. So think about that tapered roller bearing again and that issue with the, the roller end up against the thrust rib. If I now put a coating on the roller end, in normal application conditions where I have full separation of the surfaces, the coating really doesn't do anything. Uh, it's not adding any value. But if I should have an oil out event, so for some reason all the oil leaks out of my helicopter transmission, now my coating comes into play. And it becomes sacrificial at that point. But because these are hydrocarbon based coatings, that carbon starts to graphitize in dry sliding contact, and the coating will become self lubricating. Now it is sacrificial at that point, so it's not going to go on forever, but it does go on for a significant period of time, particularly if you're a helicopter pilot. Um, you're talking about, see the chart on the upper right hand side, um, consistently an all steel bearing under this oil out condition, you got about six minutes before it would fail catastrophically and it's a thermal runaway. You hit that tempering temperature, the material softens, the geometry goes and everything fails pretty quickly at that point. And with the coating applied to the roller end, and this is our ES300 coating, uh, we get a 10x improvement in oil out performance. So that can literally mean the difference between a heavy crash landing and a safe landing. And so this has now been adopted by a number of industries that require this type of performance. And in fact, is a patented technology that, uh, that we were awarded a patent on in 2010 in terms of the use of coatings in this manner. Other types of damage we see, another one, false brunelling, fretting. Uh, this occurs quite commonly during transportation of machinery where the lubrication system is not running. And even though it may have been lubricated on assembly, if things have been preloaded um, and then you know, put on the back of a rail car or on a truck and transported several thousand miles, the vibration that the system sees during transportation will cause the lubricant film to be squeezed out of the mating surfaces and now adhesive wear starts. And this is what it looks like. 
if you then run this bearing, so you take delivery of your machine and you start operating it, you're going to have a fairly early failure as a result of that. The coating is a great way to, uh, to mitigate that as well. So the last application I'll talk about, which is a great example of really how these coatings are starting to be commercialized and used aggressively, um, is an example of mitigating sliding damage. And this is in the wind industry, uh, large modular wind turbines. So the bearing systems and the mechanical systems in these wind turbines are designed to last for 20 years, but the 20 plus years. The calculation that gives you that is actually one around classical fatigue not around surface durability. And what's been found in application is in some of these bearing systems, um, they're not even getting close to 20 years. I mean, we're talking about three to seven years. And the issue is this. So one of our competitors designed in a spherical roller bearing into a very common wind turbine in the belief that um, the, the attraction of a spherical roller bearing is it deals extremely well with misalignment. Um, however, uh, the Achilles heel of the spherical roller bearing is even though the curvature of the raceway and the rolling element is the same, it allows for that self-aligning motion. The roller is running around a very small diameter, the raceway is around a much larger diameter, so if you calculate the relative surface velocities, you do not have true rolling motion. There's a lot of slip designed inherently into a spherical roller bearing, and there is, that's simple physics. There's nothing you can do about that. When you take that, and you put it in an application that is then prone to be very dynamic, and in fact, most of the time, extremely lightly loaded. These are huge machines, um, but from a bearing standpoint, the contact stress uh, is often down less than 100,000 uh, pounds per square inch, so relatively lightly loaded. So you take a lightly loaded product that's inherently got slip, and then you put it in a very dynamic environment with wind gusts and generators coming on and off the grid, which is then prone to cause even additional slip and that's at the root cause of what happens. And it's in low lambda because everything's moving very low, very slowly. You don't have enough speed in this particular application to generate a good surface film. So bring on ES322 and what Timken calls our wear resistant bearing. Now, admittedly, this is a band-aid because the, the two ways you could approach a solution for this problem one, put the right bearing system in in the first place because it shouldn't have been a spherical roller bearing. That obviously requires a major re-engineering of the mechanical system, uh, something that most operators who are the ones left picking up the bill for this particular issue uh, are not willing to address. But you can use a coating. So if we apply the coating to the roller, then we get about three and a half times improvement in, uh, in the fatigue life based on laboratory testing, field testing, uh, we're at six years and counting. So we fielded our first prototype about six years ago. Uh, we keep going up periodically and looking at the early ones we fielded. Um, the surfaces look great. The grease color is good. There's no signs of any damage. So will they last 20 years? We honestly don't know. But we can tell you that they seem to be performing much, much better than the all steel product. And this has become a great commercial success for us in terms of the aftermarket supply of this particular product, and I think it's a great uh, example of how coatings can really add value. So, what's next? Where are we headed in the future? Well, throughout the course of my career, I've seen a, a shift from what customers want from give me more bearing life, which is where things were back in the mid 70s when I started. And uh, for anyone that's of my generation that's also a Sunday morning mechanic, I mean, my first car was a 1978 Ford Escort. And I think I put 100,000 miles on that, and in 100,000 miles, I went through three sets of wheel bearings. So every Sunday morning mechanic learned how to change wheel bearings because that's just what you did. They didn't last long enough. Um, I couldn't imagine changing the wheel bearings on a, on a modern vehicle today. And a lot of that has come about through things like the steel cleanliness, improvements in bearing manufacturing technology, better knowledge about surface texture, surface design. So life is, for most customers now, it's not more life that's needed. But what we're seeing now is customers want efficiency, whether it's being driven by the needs to meet federally mandated fuel efficiency, or whether it's simply I'm the operator of a large piece of capital equipment and I want to reduce my operational expense by reducing parasitic loss in my machines, there's a big push towards improved efficiency. 
And so what we see OEMs and machine builders doing to help achieve that is things like, well, I'm building a transmission. I get a huge amount of parasitic loss from oil churning and drag. If I use a lower weight lubricant, I immediately get a huge bang for my buck. So you see this trend towards lighter lubes. And if any of you have you know, bought new vehicles recently, uh, particularly coming out of Japan, I mean, they're literally using zero weight lubes in, in some of the engines now. So that's great in terms of reducing parasitic loss and improving efficiency. But go back to that calculation of lambda ratio, it's now putting the mechanical system very much into boundary lube. So efficiency is the new life is one of my taglines. So surface durability is now what's going to limit performance uh, versus classical fatigue. Classical fatigue is, is a relatively rare failure these days. Coatings then are now playing an increasingly important role in overall system performance. And coatings are starting to be the next generation of how we drive power density. So when I say power density, what do I mean? It's quite simply the ability to do more with less. So that example of bearing performance in clean oil where we showed the oil steel and the coated bearing was 10x. Most customers don't want the 10x. They don't need that much additional life. But what they might like is if I can downsize the bearing and give them that 1x performance in a smaller bearing uh, with a total lower system cost or maybe reduced weight, which is, can be a big value driver in certain industries like aerospace. So I think we're going to see coatings continue to drive power density and our ability to do uh, things with smaller systems. And we're already seeing how coatings are removing the need for some of these very aggressive and exotic lubricants that are being added to, uh, or chemicals that are being added to lubricant systems. Um, because with the, with the coating along, we're really not relying on developing tribofilms uh, for the mechanical system to be successful. This is a little bit more futuristic, but we're starting to see research in this area too. So we embed metal carbides uh, in this matrix to give us good wear performance. There are other things you can embed in the matrix that can start to provide information about what the coating is seeing. So I think we're going to see over the course of the next five to 10 years a development of smart coatings that will provide information about the environment they're in, temperature, load potentially, other types of, uh, and these will be connected to the internet of things and the ubiquitous uh, sensing of everything. And I think we're starting to see already coatings are moving from niche to mainstream. They've clearly been adopted uh, by the automotive industry inside internal combustion engines, valve trains, piston rings, et cetera, are now all routinely coated in all modern engines. In rolling element bearings, it's a little bit slower, but you see things like the wind example that I closed with. Um, clearly, there is value to be had, and in aerospace too. Um, the big challenge is cost. The bearing industry is a relatively commoditized, price-sensitive industry. And the coatings come at a premium. You know, it's a batch process. It's relatively slow. It drives cost. So one of the biggest challenges we have in front of us, I think, is how do we achieve the same functionality that we get today in coatings like ES302, but at a lower cost? And there's a lot of work going on uh, by Timken and others um, trying to address that. And I'm confident that we will come up with solutions. And when that happens, that will just further accelerate the proliferation of this technology. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, my employer and uh, for allowing me to come and talk to you today and funding all of the work that you've seen here. And uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Vikram Bedekar, who's actually with me in the audience. So if anyone asks me any difficult scientific questions, he gets to answer them. Um, and also Ryan Evans, Carl Hager, and many of you, I think, know Gary Dahl, who's uh, ex-Timpkin and now heads up our uh, engineered services lab at the University of Akron. Thank you.